All right. Well, hey, I am glad that you are here as we dive back into 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And as I was getting ready for our time together this morning, I was um, celebrating the fact that we have welcomed a number of new faces to our community over the last couple of weeks. And it was reminding me that it might not be a bad idea to just clarify two things right at the beginning so we're all on the same page. First of all, just our overall approach to studying God's Word on a Sunday morning. Um, we are almost always as a church working our way through um, a particular book in the Bible and more or less doing that uh, verse by verse. So we have been um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 since this summer. Um, we just have a tendency to kind of break that up every once in a while um, to look at either another passage of Scripture or a topic that we think is going to be uh, particularly relevant, particularly helpful for us. So if you joined us during January when we were doing those 21 days of prayer, three weeks for God alone, my soul waits in silence, that was one of those little bit of breaks. But now we're back sort of regularly scheduled programming, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The reason I'm saying that is not that I think you're particularly interested in like what's our teaching philosophy on a Sunday morning, uh, but things are about to get really interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 um, uh, and chapter 11, which is where we're headed between now and Easter. We're going to be talking about temptation, how it works and how we can defeat it. We're going to talk a little bit about idols. Um, just for fun, we are going to do the passage about women not wearing head coverings and all of that uh, kind of stuff. So we can talk about the relationship between men and women. We're going to talk about communion. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. And it's just helpful for you to know as we get into some of these topics that feel a little stranger where you're like, why is he doing this? Like, why does he think this is the most important thing? Man, we're just following God's Word and studying the Scripture that way. So, one, that's probably helpful to be aware of. Um, the one that I really want to talk about is the fact that as a church, we are fairly obsessed with one simple question. And it's the question of what does it look like for a community to follow Jesus in such a way that we are deeply transformed, right? And that's not a theoretical exercise for us. We could ask a more specific version of that. What does it look like for this community? What does it look like for you and for me and for all of us who call Restoration City Church home? What does it look like for us to follow Jesus in this city, with all of its blessings and all of its challenges, in such a way that every single one of us experiences a deep level of transformation at the very core of who we are. Right? That's really the journey that we are on as a church. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's what I love about that church, this church. And that's really what I want to invite all of us into, whether today is your first day here or you've been around for a couple of years, today might in some ways be a reminder of what we are all about. Now, I guess the disclaimer should be that following Jesus in a way that actually leads to deep transformation is absolutely not easy, nor is it, I would argue, the norm in American Christianity. We can become far too complacent with a shallow surface level engagement with the things of God and not press into the point where our lives are actually being changed in ways that would be noticeable to ourselves, noticeable to this community, and noticeable to other people. But that is what God is calling us to. Another way of saying that is that our obsession with this sort of inner transformation means that we take both the warning and the invitation of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 seriously. We're going to talk about both of those. We're going to talk about the warning that opens up 
the passage, and it is a fairly sobering one, and then we're going to talk about the invitation that follows, and it is, I hope, a fairly inspiring one. But let's get started um, with the warning. Essentially, what Paul is trying to communicate to these first century followers of Jesus is that there is a way of following Jesus, if you want to put that in air quotes, there is a way of being associated with Jesus that is going to lead to spiritual disaster. Now, the invitation on the back end is that there is a way of following Jesus that leads to life. But before we get to the invitation, before we get to the way of Jesus, following Jesus that leads to life, we have to allow ourselves to wrestle with the warning that we see in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5. I, I want you to hear the text again, but hear it as a warning. Now, I do not want you to be unaware Another way of saying that would be, you owe it to yourselves to pay attention to this. Paul is less interested in factual knowledge, and he's more interested in inviting his Corinthian brothers and sisters to wrestle through the implications of what he's about to summarize for them. You owe it to yourselves to pay attention to this, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors. That is actually fascinating. The fact that, because Paul's going to reflect on the history of Israel. So the fact that Paul would refer to Israel as his ancestor, that's probably not at all surprising. He's a Jewish rabbi. He's a Pharisee. I mean, it's a literal ancestry for Paul, but the church in Corinth is comprised almost entirely of Gentiles, near exclusively Gentile converts, yet... He doesn't say, I want you to be aware of what happened to my ancestors. He says, I want you to be aware of what happened with our ancestors. It's not that the church has somehow replaced Israel, but that somehow Israel's story has now become the Corinthian story. Israel's story has now become our story. That in Paul's mind, these first century Gentile believers are now much more heirs to the promises of God than they are even heirs to the promises of Rome, Corinth being one of the leading cities in the Roman Empire. It's actually a really significant statement of identity that begs some obvious questions about how we see ourselves. Do we see ourselves as primarily heirs to the promises of of God more than any other allegiance that we would have. And that in and of itself could almost be a sermon, but that's not really where Paul is trying to go. He says, I want you to be aware that our ancestors were all under the cloud, talking about the fact that after Israel was miraculously freed from slavery in Egypt, God led his people through a visible cloud during the day that would then become a pillar of fire at night. All passed through the sea. He's talking about the exodus, the parting of the waters, so that the people of God could go to freedom and escape Pharaoh's armies. All were baptized into Moses, meaning they were identified with Moses. They followed Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. Remember, they get hungry, so God provides manna and ultimately quail, and they need water, so he provides that. Um, And lest we think that all of this is just God doing some party tricks where he's like, oh, look, I can part the sea, and you want to make it rain bread, I can do that, and you need water, I can do that. Paul clarifies, they all drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ, that somehow it's Jesus himself who is present to the people of the Exodus as they escape Egypt, go through the sea, and wander through the desert for some 40 years. So it feels like we're off to a really good start. We're like, man, they had it going on back then. God miraculously delivers them, parts the waters, provides what they need. You get, they get a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. Wouldn't it be nice if it was that easy for us to follow Jesus? Hold that thought. We'll come back to it. But then the text takes this radical turn. Sounds like things are going great. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them since they were struck down in the wilderness. 
that these people were saturated in the things of God, yet somehow not pleasing to God. That despite everything they experienced, everything they had a front row seat to, they somehow missed something essential. So much so that the vast majority of them never saw the promised land, which is a bit of an understatement because it seems like only Jacob, Caleb, and those under 20 actually entered the promised land ever. So when he says God was displeased with most of them, God was displeased with almost all of them. What we're going to have to wrestle with is what did they miss? What went wrong? But for a minute, let's just reflect on the fact that you and I could easily fall into the exact same trap, even though we're more spiritually advantaged than they were. It's not that they had a better deal, because they get clouds and fire and seas and all of that kind of stuff. In Paul's understanding, and it should be the case in our understanding, we have the better deal. They were baptized into Moses. God sent for them a redeemer and a deliverer to lead them out of slavery, and his name was Moses. But God has sent for us a redeemer and a deliverer to lead us out of slavery to sin and death, and his name is Jesus. We're better off, not worse. Yes, they were guided by a cloud of during the day and a pillar of fire, but we're guided by the indwelling spirit of God. Yes, they had spiritual food and spiritual drink, but we have a table that offers Christ himself as spiritual food and spiritual drink. We're not worse off. We're better off, but we could still fall into the exact same trap. At the very least, it has to be possible that we could be baptized, regularly take communion, and even have some participation in the life of the Spirit of God and still fail to enter the promised land. Paul is simply teaching here what Jesus communicated succinctly in Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And few find it. The warning of 1 Corinthians 10 is that you could be on the wide road and never know it. That it is possible to be so busy living life, doing church, that we never slow down to pay attention to the reality that there is something off in the way that we're following Jesus. We never slow down enough to realize that there might even be something deeply wrong with the way we're following Jesus. Maybe we're not even following Jesus at all. We're simply just associated with him or occasional participants in a community that's somehow about him. There's something wrong. And, and, and by the way, just say super clearly and quickly, I'm not bringing that up to make you feel terrible. I'm not bringing that up to make you feel guilty and ashamed. I'm bringing it up, one, because it's what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 10, but I'm bringing it up because I've been there. And I, I know what it is to feel like you're doing all the right things. You're trying. You're wanting to get it right. You're following much of the prescription, yet you just know that there has to be more to this whole Jesus thing than what you're experiencing. Right? That's really why I'm obsessed with this question of how do we change Because for years I followed Jesus in a way that didn't lead to very much change in my life. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for any of us. 
Which is why I want to pivot to the invitation that lies right under the surface of verse 6. You're going to have to stick with me. Let me explain where we're going because you're going to be like, I don't understand how verse 6 like, helps. It just feels like verse 6 sort of drives the nail into the coffin. So stick with me for a minute. Now these things, all this bad stuff that we're about to read about, took place as examples for us. By the way, I do not believe that the sole purpose purpose of all of these things that Paul is about to recount is simply so that you and I could have a case study, simply so that you and I could have an object lesson, right? It seems like a very cruel picture of God that he would cause 23, 24,000 people to die in a day and be like, you're welcome, Restoration City. There's your illustration for you. I don't think that's at all what God is up to. I think there was a lot happening there, but what Paul is trying to say here is that we need to learn from what happened to Israel. It happened as examples for us. So, so that, here's the point, we will not desire evil things as they did. It seems like The core problem of what was going on with Israel in the wilderness that caused them to miss out on life with God is that although they were associated with the things of God, although they were front row spectators to the things of God, it somehow happened that their relationship with God did not transform their hearts. They weren't transformed at the core of who they are. They weren't transformed at the level of of desire. And it's so helpful that Paul is willing to use, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the word desire. Because that is a word that is designed to help us wrestle with the deepest parts of our soul. To wrestle with the deepest parts of our heart. And the problem, by the way, is not desire itself. Right? That's one of the challenges that I have with much of the New Age movement and aspects of Eastern philosophy that somehow pretend that if we could just rid ourselves of desire, then we would solve the problem. But to rid yourself of desire is to make yourself less than human. The problem is not that we desire. We were, in fact, designed to desire. The problem is that we end up either desiring the wrong things or we end up with an inordinate and misplaced desire for the right things. It's a sword that can touch two different ways. The problem was their core hadn't been changed. Now, here's why this is good news. Paul doesn't simply bring this up as an exercise of condemnation. He obviously believes that it is possible to follow Jesus in a way that transforms our hearts. There's almost a sense where Paul seems to believe that is, for lack of a better term, normative Christianity. There's almost a sense that if we're doing it right, we are experiencing transformation in our hearts, that ultimately, as followers of Jesus, the way we understand this working is that our lives are transformed as our hearts are transformed. But we're often not clear about what that heart transformation looks like, what it feels like, what we're really after, which is, again, why I love that he drops it down into this level of desire and longing. Because it's really easy to talk about heart change without really being clear of what we mean by that. Like, what does that mean? Like, we sometimes operate with this idea that, like, I don't know, like, I used to be selfish. Now I feel like I'm a little less selfish, and I have no idea how that happened. But, like, that wouldn't be an acceptable explanation in any other area of life. Like, you wouldn't consider that, like, you know, a sound explanation of the road to financial health. You're like, man, I don't know, I used to be pretty poor. I don't know. Now I'm less poor. Well, something about saving. I don't know. Right? I mean, any other area of life, if you tried to apply that to fitness to your career, you're like, I don't don't know. Just promoted. I just sat here, did nothing. Um, And it just happened. Right? I mean, you would never do that. That wouldn't make sense. Yet, that's sometimes our approach to God. We're like, I don't know. It's just something I have. I don't know. It's just I'm less selfish. I'm more loving. I'm more patient. I'm just kinder. Give it time. Yeah, I mean, and yes, do give it time. 
But maybe as we're giving it time, we can also give it a little bit more thought than that. Listen to me. Our lives are lived not through the lens of our intention, but lived through the lens of our desires. Head knowledge is great. Head knowledge is great when it comes to following Jesus. But here's what you need to know about yourself. When your head and your heart get into a fight, your heart wins every single time. Which is the explanation for the vast majority of stupid stuff that we all do. Right? Yes, God's word, tremendously helpful. And God's word will lead me to places that I never would have gotten on my own. Right? I would never have gotten to love your enemies if left by myself. I need that one spelled out in black and white or red and white, depending on what Bible you have. Like, I need that one written down and be like, oh my gosh, he really means okay, that's good. There is absolutely a role for head knowledge. And there are absolutely ethical issues in our day today where we pull back from the table and we're like, Man, I need to think about that. We need to figure out, I need to pray about that. That's not as cut and dry and clear as we might pretend. That's worth considering. But for me, just as I live my life, my challenge is the places where I know exactly what I'm supposed to do, yet I just somehow find myself in the moment unable to say something kind. Right? Or sometimes in the moment I just find myself unable to stay quiet. I just don't say anything at all. Right? I find myself unable to do these things. It's because when our heads and our hearts get into a fight, our heart wins every single time. In case you think I'm making that up, let's tag in Kurt Thompson. Um, he is one of the leading thinkers about the intersection of Christian spiritual formation and psychology. He's actually a psychiatrist. He practices right out in Falls Church. If you want, you can go hang out with Kurt, make an appointment. But here's what he'll tell you about yourself. We are desiring creatures. We are created, not self-made, and we are made with the intention to love, to desire. Your desire isn't the problem. Your desire is proof of your humanity. Furthermore, look at this. Our behavior is far more powerfully driven by the habits we form in our embodied movement than by what we think. Before we are thinking creatures, we are desiring and then habit-forming creatures. And by the way, it's not just me and Kurt and other people like that that would say this. It would be Jesus primarily who would say this. We're all just trying to expand off of Luke chapter 6, verse 45, when Jesus says this, A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his or her heart, for his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Scripture is enormously clear that the control center of our lives is our heart, not our head. So it would make sense if our lives are shaped by our hearts, and what we're after is a transformed life, that the way God is going to do that is by transforming, by remapping the desires, the deepest longings of our soul. The question is, are we following Jesus in such a way that that is even close to possible? Is, is that what we're even looking for? Or are we just looking for a series of religious boxes to check, activities to engage in, things that we can do to make ourselves feel better about ourselves, to ease our conscience? Are we just looking for information so that we will have the little factoid and the little tidbit that impresses everybody at the Bible study? Are we just looking to enhance our doctrinal foundation so that we can win all of the different arguments? And look, I'm not against doctrine in any way, shape, or form. I felt called to spend my whole life teaching the scriptures to people. I'm just asking the question, are we really looking to God for deep transformation at the essence of who we are? Or are we playing an altogether different and inferior game? 
Because I'm telling you, the game that God wants to play is the game that gets played in the deepest recesses of your heart. That's where he wants to go to work. So we have to ask at least one more question before we're done. How do we move in that direction? Because obviously, all right, Restoration City, there we go, we're done. Here's, here's the application. Stop desiring evil things. Yeah, right. I, like, I would have been happy if that had led to like uproarious laughter where you're like, wow, you know nothing about the human condition. It doesn't work that way. Like there's no, even if I give you a really specific list of all kinds of bad stuff, you, we're not going to sit back here and be like, oh, thanks for the clarification. Idolatry, bad. Okay, I'll go tear down the idol in the living room. Oh, sexual immorality. So shocked to see that Jesus is not a fan. Okay, I promise I'll stop. And something about grumbling. Okay, no more grumbling. Oh, thanks for clarifying that. I'll just get all that junk out of the deepest recesses of my soul and let's take communion and sing a song. It doesn't work that way. If it does, like, bless God. Um, but I don't think it does. It doesn't work that way for me. So how do you do this? How does this start to happen? Well, I think at this point we would agree on two things. Number one, a full answer to that question would probably take all day. And number two, just to apply the sermon right away, none of us desire that. No, right? You're like, yeah, you got five minutes. Land the plane. Okay, so let me give you four quick thoughts in five minutes about how you move in this direction. Number one, start with Scripture. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is still in the Bible. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is true that when your head and your heart get into a fight, your heart wins. It is also true that your head, your mind, is able to influence your heart. There is a part of this that comes by learning to think differently. There is a part of this that comes by saturating our minds and our hearts in the Word of God. There is something to be said for learning to see all of life through the, end, the lens of Scripture. So by no means am I saying like, Whoo, Bible, out the door, let's start from scratch, blank sheet of paper. No, you want to move in this direction? Move deeply into the Word of God. Romans 12.2 is still in the Bible. The problem is Romans 12.2 is not the only verse in the Bible that talks about transformation. As you read all of Scripture, you realize that there is also an invitation to follow Jesus in a lifestyle of intentional formation. That as we individually engage with practices like prayer, silence, solitude, fasting, generosity, God uses those practices that become habits to shape our heart. Right? This is why as a community we're so influenced by thinkers like Dallas Willard and Richard Foster, why we're so influenced by those who have tried to understand the role of the spiritual disciplines in the Christian life, Eugene Peterson and others. And yes, it comes as we reflect on the Word of God, but there's a role for silence and solitude and fasting. There's also a role for communal practices, observing the Sabbath, gathering weekly for worship, confessing sin to one another, taking communion. All of these things that we try to build into the rhythm of our community, they are all ways of realigning the desires of our heart, right? As we realize that there was probably something in many of us this morning that considered option one, I could just stay at home and enjoy an extra cup of coffee. Option two, I could just go out and have brunch with all of my friends. That's for young single people. Um, and then option three, um, I could go to church and sing some songs and listen to the Word of God and take communion. And most of us have been taught like, look, you better do option three. That's the Christian answer. But hopefully, 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 as you made the choice to come in option three, God has done something in your soul where you're like, yeah, but you know what? This is what I really needed. 
this is the thing that's really going to touch the anxiety that I've been carrying all week. This is the thing that's really going to touch the guilt and the shame. This is the thing that's going to provide courage. Yes, I could have gone and had brunch, and it would have been a three-hour escape, and it would have been awesome, but it wouldn't have given me what I needed to make it through the week. Oh, look, what I really desire is to be with the people of God in the presence of God. Oh, look, this is what I really want. It's one small deposit in forming new habits that form new hearts. Right? These practices matter. Number three, though, supernatural grace. At the end of the day, it is by grace that we are saved, through faith, so that nobody can work. The idea here is not to develop a surefire rhythm of spiritual discipline, so much so that you'd feel like you no longer need grace, that you're like, man, I'm just going to do this by willpower alone and effort, and I'm just going to train myself into a life of godliness. No, we are utterly dependent on the supernatural transforming power of the Spirit of God, who works slowly and all of a sudden, both at the same time who remaps our souls over decades of discipleship, yet is able to touch our lives in an instant. And the reason that I'm trying to be clear about that is that I do think there is a danger in churches like ours that want to talk about spiritual and emotional and relational health and churches like ours that want to talk about deep transformation where everybody becomes enamored with getting a therapist, which I am not opposed to at all, but everybody comes enamored with getting a therapist and thinks they're going to find in their therapist's office what God intended for them to find in the church. You may very well need both. That's great. That's fine. I meet with a spiritual director once a month, and I'm so grateful for the ways God uses him to challenge me and shape my soul and bring things to the surface. But I'm telling you, there's no regimen of counseling. Even if you go get in with Kurt down the road, um, that's going to take the place of coming to a table and being reminded of the gospel and taking that which is spiritual food and spiritual drink. you got to have both. Now, the fourth component to tie us back into 1 Corinthians 10 is some level of self-awareness. Part of what we're trying to do is just learn how to drop down to a level where we even pay attention to our desires and our longings. This isn't easy stuff. This isn't shallow stuff. This isn't superficial stuff. This isn't stuff you're going to be able to access without carving out some space for some serious introspection. Because watch what happens. Watch, watch what happens. Paul, in verse 6, says we have all of these problems, and they were all the result of desiring evil things, yet verses 7 to 11, he lists out a series of actions. He tells us very little about the evil desires. All he tells us about is the sin that they gave birth to, right? So I'm not going to preach this as a list of bad things to be avoided. It is obviously that. My question all week has been, what are the underlying desires that gave rise to the behaviors that you see in 7 through 11, right? If verse 7 says, don't become idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and they got up to party. What's the desire under that? It's not just the surface level desire for a good time. It's a desire that's deeply rooted in what people would talk about as idolatry. It is really a desire that takes aim at where our sense of safety, security, and well-being come from. That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Where does your sense of safety, security, and well-being come from. The most specific way to get your handle, hands on that question is when things aren't going your way, what do you look to for comfort? What do you look to to tell yourself that it's all going to be okay? And for some of us, it's our finances, right? You feel stressed, you feel like things are, you know, not going well, and you just start walking through a litany of, yeah, but here's how much equity we have in the house, and here's what the retirement accounts are worth, and here's this, and this is performing, when, and you're like, oh, see, it's going to be okay. Now, some of us, I understand that complete, like, dud of an example, because all of your stress is related to your finances. Totally, totally understand that. 
I'm just talking coping mechanisms to use different language. Right? For some of us, it's sexual fantasies. For others, it's vacations. It's just the thing that we mentally retreat to, to be like, oh, it's all going to be okay. We've got that trip coming up in a couple of weeks. It's, this is what I need to feel comfortable. This is what I need for a sense of well-being. Right? Let us not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did in a single day. Uh, 23,000 people died sexual desires. It's not just Jesus being excessively prudish. It's Jesus reminding us that our sexual and relational desires are deeply connected. Right? The question for us is, how are you satisfying your desire for deep relational connection with others? Are you settling for casual one-night stands or just casual, ongoing relationships? Are you centered, are you settling for friendships that are really nothing more than an ongoing gossip text chain? Like, are, are, what are we doing to try to meet our deep need for relational connection? Are you connecting with real people or are most of your relationships digital and online where you're spending more of your time reacting to what other people are posting on their Instagram feed than you are interacting with the people who live in your own house, whether that's your spouse and kids or your roommates, right? Two more examples and then we're gonna be done. Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. The core question here is, is there any place where your desire has allowed you to distort truth? This is talking about the time in Exodus where things are not going well and they start to grumble and complain and say, man, I wish we had never left Egypt. It would have been better for us had we just stayed in Egypt. It's not just a lack of gratitude. It, it is a total lie. They didn't want to stay in Egypt said, nobody ever, gosh, my life was better as a slave. If only I could go back and be malnourished and make bricks all day, that would be awesome. But we've all been there where we've gotten to places where some unmet desire in our life has caused us to start to believe or say things that we know are not true, right? Parents, you know what it's like to be like, man, maybe we shouldn't have had kids, Right? Where you're like, this could have all been a big mistake. Um, right? And, and in the moment that you say that, you're like, what is wrong with me? Like, I love, we have three kids. I love these three kids more you know, than I ever thought possible. I would do anything for them. But every once in a while, you're like, you know what would have made life simple? And my house would be cleaner. <laughs> you're believing a lie. I'm believing a lie. They were believing a lie. Where have you allowed desire to distort truth? And then you take the same thing into grumbling and complaining, which was a grumbling and complaining against Moses and Aaron as their leaders. Where has desire caused you to use people, not love them? That's what was going on. They wanted Moses and Aaron to deliver a bill of goods. And when Moses and Aaron failed to deliver what they wanted, they had no interest anymore. They were using them, not loving them. We can so easily do that. Those are the kinds of questions that we need to allow ourselves to wrestle with. Yes, with our journal, but also in community. Because it's that level of self-awareness that opens our heart up to the deep work that God wants to do. James Smith is a professor at Calvin And he says this about this life of discipleship, this life of following Jesus. It's more a matter of hungering and thirsting than of knowing and believing. Jesus' command to follow him is a command to align our loves and longings with his. To want what God wants, to desire what God desires, to hunger and thirst after God and crave a world where he is all in all, a vision encapsulated by the shorthand the kingdom of God. You were made to love. You were made to desire. You are just made to love and desire the things that God loves and desires. You are made to hunger and thirst for the kingdom of God. And it's that quest, it's that project that gets me so excited about what God is doing in our church as we figure out how do we follow Jesus in a way that transforms us at the core of who we are. Why? Well, one, I don't want any of us to miss the promised land. And two, I want all of us to know the joy of living life with God right here and right now.